Welcome to Blackburn Presbyterian Church. It's great to be back, and uh, several of you have already said that to me. Not everyone feels able to come back, uh, as you're probably aware, uh, although we're allowed to have a person every two square meters. Uh, we understand why some people feel that way, and we've decided uh, for their sake and for sake of others to continue streaming our service uh, for those who can't attend and for those who may be interstate and overseas and who have been joining us during the live stream. This poses, of course, some challenges for us. So we ask your patience uh, as we, uh, and your forbearance as, and, and also your feedback as we uh, adjust to this new normal, uh, a service that is both gathered and streamed live to our, our internet. The order of service will be similar to uh, that which has been streamed previously. So if you've been watching us on the stream, you'll have an idea what to expect. But the difference will be that we will begin and end with singing. Uh, and in this case today, you won't be surprised that we will sing a carol at the start and at the close of the service. Before we open in prayer and sing that opening carol, I'm, I'd like to introduce the session clerk, uh, Keith Ferris. Keith, if you'd like to come forward and bring us the notices. This makes things feel really normal. Thank you, Graham. And on behalf of the uh, you know, minister and the session, I would give a warm uh, welcome to you all. And uh, particularly, um, we have two, uh, two visitors. Uh, Jacob, who has... Um, helped us uh, immensely in the uh, setting up of streaming and also uh, his wife Diana. We, we're very pleased to have you both with us. Um, today marks a few milestones in the, uh, in the life of this church. The first one is that at six years um, uh, or have just passed since uh, Graham commenced his ministry here. His first service was on the 30th of uh, uh, November in, nine, in 2014 and um, uh, conducted the, uh, the following week was the, the first time he conducted communion uh, with us. Also, there's another milestone. Next Thursday, uh, on the 17th of uh, December, is the 31st uh, anniversary of the first service in this church. Uh, it was uh, conducted by the moderator of the Presbyterian Church at that time, the Reverend Dr. Uh, Alan Harmon, and uh, the church was packed uh, at that time. Um, now, as far as the other notices are concerned, next Wednesday is, uh, is our um, sweet hour of prayer, we call it, uh, and that will be the last one for the year as we'll go into recess then till February. As I've said previously, um, uh, our God does not rest or go into recession you know, or, or recess. So uh, uh, keep on praying. Now, uh, one, uh, one other item, the, there won't be an offering during the service itself, but your offering today will be uh, received uh, at the door. There's a, a plate on a chair there near the door there, so uh, uh, we'll have it. But it, the problems are uh, complying with the confounded rules that we're landed with about handing things around uh, for um, uh, for various um, um, items, shall we say? So um, we'll have that as a, uh, a retiring there. Um, uh, also, communion. Uh, normally, we'd be uh, communion services. We've decided to defer them until such time as we're allowed to have the um, elements being handed around. There's, under present conditions, uh, we're not supposed to um, serve food or 
all the likes, uh, and uh, we would like to have it in, as a normal service uh, when we serve the, the elements. And um, uh, the alternative is some churches do, they, it's a case of a bring your own elements. So um, uh, we've decided to leave it until later. Um, next Sunday, uh, Graham will uh, continue with the Advent services and then on the following Friday, Friday? The 25th anyway, the 25th of December, we'll be having a Christmas service here at 9.30. So uh, I won't be able to say in the meantime, your free will offering will be received. So, but uh, uh, bear in mind for the close of the service. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Keith. You, you didn't mention the uh, big 9-0 birthday that you had while we've been waiting to come together. Congratulations. And uh, <laughs> well, <I'm, laughs> it was long enough for three quarters of us to have birthdays, actually. Well, so. Another one that had the same. Uh, another. Uh, two months before that. That's very true. We've missed not being able to celebrate our birthdays together. Well, shall we begin then with prayer? Let us unite our hearts and pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beauty of this new day, and we thank you for the joy of being able to come together to sing your praise, to remember the birth of the Lord Jesus, our Saviour. We thank you for the rich Christmas traditions that we have, and we thank you in particular that we've known the story of Jesus for a long time, some of us 90 years or even more. And we ask your blessing as we reflect upon the Gospel of Luke this morning, and we pray that your spirit will speak to us about the things we need to hear. So hear us and help us as we offer you our praise and as we tune in to your word once again. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, our opening hymn is uh, the carol, uh, O Come All Ye Faithful. And I think this morning there's a sense of having come together. And let's, uh, let's sing this with joy.
Please be seated. Well, we told you to watch for glitches, and you've found the first one already. Probably two or three, actually, come to think of it. I'm not going to stand in front of the microphone while we're singing next time. So we've come to that point in the service which we called Young at Heart. And Christine has been very involved in this, uh, in the live stream. So I'm going to ask Christine to come forward and share something that she wanted to share with us today. Thanks. Isn't this a special day? I feel a little bit teary actually seeing you all there instead of looking at empty, <coughs> empty seats and no one at the organ. And Shirley, glad you're here, even if not able to <laughs> play. Um, those of you who have watched the live stream know that I never intended this to become a regular feature. It was just um, when I heard about Florence Nightingale way back in March. I wanted to share that and then we had so much feedback that it's continued. Some weeks I've got something I know I want to share from very early on. Other weeks I'm struggling. But this week early on I was absolutely inspired by Australian story. Can I just check, where am I meant to look? Down there, okay. <laughs> there, all right, okay, sorry. <laughs> so I'll try not to neglect you, is that glitch number four? Usually we watch Australian story on a Monday night. It's often challenging, it's almost always inspiring. And last week, there were two 15-minute segments, very different, um, the one from the other. The one I'm going to talk about concerns a man called Professor John Grant Thompson, who was 81 when the program was made, which I think was quite close. You forget that New South Wales has and Queensland were out of lockdown and so able to make programs without distancing. Jack John Thompson was a member of the NASA team that established the Toowoomba Kubi Creek tracking station that researched satellite communications culminating in the moon landing. So he's been involved in exciting things for a long time. Initially, he worked at the University of South Queensland before it was a university. And he started his work as a humble technician, processing data. Then, I don't know the details, he did further study and presumably further study and became Professor of Medical Engineering. But what I want to talk about today and I think what he is going to be remembered for long after he's gone is his involvement in the world leading, and it is the world leading, Mansell Infant Retrieval System, but it's now called Neocot. And it was first used in 2000, and that date is very significant. It actually began as a retrieval device bed for injured soldiers. That was why he started working on it. But for reasons I don't know, only 10 were made. The concept was then reworked and in consultation with doctors in neonatal and other pediatric units, it was created, and I have to read this bit, 
It's a heated capsule surrounded by monitoring and resuscitation equipment. So it's essentially an intensive care unit on wheels. So it meant that a baby born away from a capital city within Australia can be transported safely. A baby born very prim who cannot be catered for in the local hospital. And this is quite amazing because really, by world standards, we are quite a small nation. But every month in Australia, more than 300 babies are transported using this neocot. And it's now totaling over 4,000 a year. It's already being used in Norway and Sweden. And inquiries are coming in from the UK and the USA. So... Even if we didn't get the vaccine this week, we've done something pretty fantastic in the world, or this team has. One of the many things I liked about this man was, is his humil humility. He says, this is an example of what can be achieved when universities and industries work together. So when the, in this case, the academics, the doctors and the engineers all work together. And I think this is often the case with people who've achieved what we would consider great things. They're often very humble. In his words, I just made the tool. It's the doctors who are the clever people. Now, to come back to 2000, the first baby transported, and I think it was from Rockhampton, to Brisbane was a man, now 20, called Lochlan. In 2017, Lochlan's mother was at a conference and she got talking to this guy at the same table and discovered he was John Grant Thompson, the inventor of the cot, which she is convinced saves, saved her baby's life. Now, there's several lessons to be learned from this story, and partly because of the time of year, and once a teacher, always a teacher. I've been thinking in terms of young people at school trying to choose subjects to do, and young people who've just finished this year 12 of all year 12s, wondering what subjects they should choose at uni, if they get a choice. And then people finishing uni, working which direction to take. We used to always say, follow your passions, choose those subjects you enjoy, work hard at them, make sure your choices fit your values. So don't choose a course that you know is going to lead into work that is not what you agree with. In, his, in Professor Thompson's case, the basic core value for him is the value of every human life. And I feel glad to be part of a society which puts such effort into saving the life of babies born prim. At the same time, I'm concerned that some of the laws and practices in our society do not reflect that same valuing of babies, human beings, from the utero to the grave. But today, let's just celebrate the care of these prem babies and remember, who was it said when the disciples thought they weren't important enough for him to spend his time on them? Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. May he bless us all. Thank you, Christine. What a great thing to value every human life and to uh, commit your abilities and your skills to preserving it. Now we come to our Bible reading, and Amanda, who has played so much for us in the lockdown, is going to do the Bible reading today. Thank you, Amanda. 
I'm reading from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that we be be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is Christ, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Amen. Thank you, Amanda. What a familiar passage that is. How many times have you heard it read? Every Christmas. In fact, it's going to be uh, the theme of our, of our closing carol is basically a paraphrase of those words. So as we turn to uh, think about them together, uh, let me just briefly say a short prayer. We ask, Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts will be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, the four Sundays of Advent, we've been exploring the meaning of Christmas. And uh, I said early on that as we looked at Matthew's Gospel in the first Sunday in Advent, that the key word in Matthew's Gospel is Emmanuel. He uses that term and he uses Isaiah's message about Emmanuel. Mark's Gospel doesn't tell us anything about baby Jesus. There's nothing there. He begins with Jesus as a 30-year-old beginning a mission Um, But he does tell us why Jesus came. In fact, Jesus tells us why he came in Mark's gospel. He didn't come to be served. He came to serve and to give. That's Mark 10.45. Great passage. And so Mark presents Jesus as the servant who came. Now today we've come to Luke's gospel with what uh, Rita Finger of the Sojourners community in Washington says is... The un- on the unex- with the unexpected embryos and unusual women who carry them, Jesus begins life as a human baby. A human baby. Christine's reflection already brought us to the preciousness of a human baby and the, the uh, wonder of living in a country that can put such massive effort into making sure that even premature babies can be brought safely to centres of excellence where they can uh, be, be helped to survive. So, so what is it, what's the defining word, I, I thought, in, in Luke's gospel for us today? And I want to suggest to you that according to Luke, the uh, defining word is saviour. Saviour. And that's what I want us to think about. So let's think first of all about the shepherds and the angels. Well, Luke gives a, a background to Jesus' birth in the parallel pregnancies of Elizabeth and Mary. And these throw into relief the doubt of the old priest Zechariah. He questioned, you remember? But it also throws, by way of contrast, the faith of the young Mary. I mean, a a young girl of Mary's age really didn't count for very much in the ancient world until she was married and had a husband and so on. And her meaning was achieved through her her role as a wife and and a mother. So here is the girl who counts for very little. And she says, be it to me according to thy word. 
So we've got this contrast in the parallel pregnancies, but there's also a lot of joyful singing. Something new is afoot, something wonderful and joyful, and it's expressed in the song of Mary, the song of Zechariah, the song of the angels, which uh, Amanda has just read to us, and, and after this, the song of the old Simeon, the old man Simeon who is in the temple hoping to see the Lord's anointed and is there when Mary and Joseph bring the child. And the anthem of the angels intimates the birth of Mary's child. We used to put birth notices in the paper. It's a long time, but I re remember vaguely announcing the birth of children. Some of us are old enough to remember when the birth of a baby appeared in a shop notice in a window. You know, it's a boy or it's a girl in the days when people were free to say those things. But, but, uh, but the angel message, you know, we want to make public this news of our own children. People, I guess, today will use Facebook and Instagram. I received a couple of photos of a newborn baby uh, in the last 10 days and uh, a very excited couple telling me about their baby. But this wasn't for public. This was at night. It was almost a covert activity. Sure, the angels were there to tell the shepherds. What do we know about shepherds at night out in the fields? Well, it's outside the little town of Bethlehem, also called in our famous hymn, Royal David's City. And I want to remind you uh, of a shepherd boy who was summoned from the fields outside Bethlehem. You remember when Samuel was a prophet? A shepherd boy came. And so Luke wants us to see this parallel. A shepherd boy coming, caring for the flocks in Bethlehem. Bethlehem, of course, wasn't far from Jerusalem, and the flocks being catered there were almost certainly for sacrifice at the temple. So there are shepherds outside the little town of Bethlehem, and, and they uh, remind us of David, and the demands of a shepherd's work were really challenging. They didn't have fields marked off with fences. They didn't have blaze aid to restore fences after fires. No, they had... Uh, just let me go through this, Mark and uh, Luke. I'm just getting carried away here. But the, uh, we're looking at Luke, and I wanted to use this idea of a savior. I've used this image of a lifesaver to go with the points I want to make. And I'm making the first point, which is the shepherds and the angels. But I'm going to go down this track here for your information. I want to talk, too, about Augustus and uh, an earthly savior. I want to talk about um, the idea of... Uh, in Jesus' saving work, what did he do as a savior? And then I want to think about inclusion, a kind of kingdom that includes people. So here we are, we're thinking about uh, the shepherds and the angels. And the, the shepherds, because of their work, couldn't keep their hands clean. In Israel, cleanliness was important. There were important rituals of washing and cleanliness before meals and especially before involvement in church. You had to sanitize your hands before you came into the temple in the old days. Now, they were particular about cleanliness. I'm sure you know, there was a big bronze laver for the priests. Had to had to be clean. Everything had to be clean. There had to be a great water supply at the temple. And so here we've got shepherds and they're not able to be involved in the religious life of Israel. They're unclean. They're on the outside. And this meant that uh, they were regarded as outsiders as far as the religious community was concerned. And even worse, it was common to suspect their honesty. And the ancient Jewish writings also tell us that they weren't permitted to give testimony in a Jewish court of law. Outsiders, the shepherds, these are the people to whom the message came. These are the ones who heard the sound of the angels at night time. And they were expected to know the meaning of the religious terminology of Israel. They knew what the, who the Lord was, and they knew what the, uh, the Christ meant, the, the Master and the Messiah. These were common terms. And now they're being told that the Savior has come. And this is the word Luke wants us to think about more. The need to be saved. I want you to think about this a little bit more. 
At chapter 2, at the very beginning, the passage that Amanda read says, at that time the emperor, Augustus, ordered a census. So he's very conscious as he's writing this account of the birth of Jesus that the empire was there and Augustus was the emperor. And if you think that's just an occasional passing reference, as you read on, you'll discover chapter 3 begins with the next emperor. It was the 15th year of the reign of the emperor Tiberius. So Luke is telling us the birth story in the context of the Roman Empire. Now, Before the empire, there was a republic governed by the Senate. And it was a different arrangement. But after the Battle of Actium and the death of Mark Antony, Julius Caesar proclaimed himself sole emperor of the, and the empire emerged. And so Augustus was the adopted adopted son-in-law of Julius Caesar. And his story, it's in his lifetime that Jesus was born. He was was, uh, given to describing himself uh, very, uh, um, we might say arrogantly or egotistically, you've, if you go to many museums in the, in the old country and the old world, you'll find images of Augustus Caesar with his arm outstretched. He's a handsome man. He's good looking. He's got power. And this is the emperor. Lots of images of the emperor. If you can read Latin inscriptions on some of the coins, you'll discover that he's crediting Julius Caesar with being divine. And that he, Augustus, is the son of God, son of a God. That's him. In fact, you'll find inscriptions where Augustus describes himself as as the Lord and Savior of the world. He was the Savior of the world. He had quelled the rebellion and he had brought in the Roman peace. But for all its marvelous engineering and all its ability to oversee the uh, the uh, management of a great empire, it was built on brutal uh, military power and inhumane slavery. This is the empires of the world. They are like this. They use military power and they separate out the people who are important from the people who aren't important. In the empire, in the empire Augustus was divine. And there were lots of other people who counted at different stages. But if you look at uh, Joel Green's book on the the proportions of the communities that mattered, you'll find at the bottom there's a large class of expendable people. If you go to Rome, you'll find that there were people who slaved to keep the baths hot and never really got out of the underground where they worked. It was a brutal place. And we know that from many other things as well. Well, this was known to Luke, a Gentile. He wasn't Jewish. He's the only non-Jewish writer in the New Testament. And he, I wonder if he sometimes felt like an outsider. All his other writers, uh, people he was learning from, they were Jews. Paul, he traveled with Paul and, and he went to synagogue, to synagogue with him. And I wonder if he knew what being an outsider felt like. So there was a, a sense of what the earthly, the earthly uh, savior was like, like Augustus. And, uh, and yet the angel message is to the people who don't count. And they're the shepherds. And he, the shepherds tell them that the saving work of uh, Jesus is, is happening. The message of the herald angels couldn't communicate a greater contrast. The master and Messiah has come. How were they going to identify this child? Well, the words are so familiar. You will find him in an animal feeding trough. Oh, sorry, you'll find him in a manger. It sounds so cute, doesn't it? You'll find him in a manger, an animal feeding trough. He is your savior. So they knew when they went there that this unusual thing of a baby in a hay, hay box was the savior. This is the child. And it was like the angel said. And they returned to their flocks rejoicing. They were really happy that the savior had come. And throughout the gospel of Luke, uh, we find Jesus rescuing people again and again. 
And this is what we want to focus on. This is what a savior does. That's why I use the image of the lifesaver to go along with this. In fact, I've used the image of a female lifesaver because in Australia, we just expect it to be a man. Christine looks at me quizzically. Uh, Maybe we don't expect it to be a man. But at Bondi Beach, when I've been there, almost all the lifesavers have been men. And... And here's something we don't expect. And what I want to suggest to you is that Luke is presenting us with something we don't expect. Jesus has come for the people who are last in the queue. Jesus has come for the people who are at the bottom of the pile, for the least important. Jesus has come for the lost people of the world. And I'll give you some examples of this so so that it doesn't appear that I've just picked these out of the air. I've picked them all from Luke's gospel. The last. Who was last? in terms of who counted in Judah. Well, you remember, if you, well, let me remind you anyway, in chapter 9, verse 51, Jesus had to go through Samaria. And he wasn't welcome there. And the disciples wanted to call down lightning to blast them away. And Jesus rebuked his disciples. You can't just get rid of people because they think differently from you. Jesus' approach was different. In fact... Uh, in the in the uh, in the ninth chapter, uh, chapter ten, sorry, the uh, the most famous story of all, probably, from the New Testament. Now that's that's a big suggestion, but perhaps we could debate the top three. But the story of the Good Samaritan, the Good Samaritan, is known around the world. Why is that? Was it the priest? No, it wasn't. Was it the Levite who went to help the man who was lying, beaten and bruised and broken by the roadside? No, it wasn't. Who was it? It was the... It must have been hard for a Jew to say it. It was the Samaritan. Could it really have been like that? So Jesus is raising these people. He's showing he's come for them. And even at the, toward the end in chapter 17, there's that beautiful story of Jesus healing Ten people with leprosy. Only one came to say thank you. And and that one, yeah, he was a Samaritan. So Jesus is looking for the last and the least like the shepherds. You know, the women in the ancient world didn't have a vote either. They were like the shepherds. Their, Their voice wasn't heard by the legal authorities. That's why, for example, when the Apostle Paul lists the witnesses to the resurrection and the first witnesses were all women, yet when Paul lists them in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he only lists men because only men had a legal status. Only men's voices counted. So he says, well, here are the legal witnesses. But the Gospels all tell us that the women were there first. So Jesus is interested in women. He taught, the, he taught women and he received their support. Unique, uh, uh, perhaps, to, to the Gospels is, is at the beginning of chapter 8 of Luke's Gospel where Luke tells us that there were a number of women who ministered to Jesus. They supported him uh, and, his, and his entourage. It's, and it's an interesting little reference Jesus traveled through towns and villages, preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. The 12 disciples went with him, and so did some women who had been healed of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom Jesus had driven out seven demons. Joanna, whose husband, Chusa, was an officer in Herod's court, so a woman of what would be regarded as high standing. And Susanna, and many other women, many other women, who used their own resources to help Jesus and his disciples. Now, you know, rabbis didn't teach women. And there's a rabbinic prayer, I thank you, Lord, that I've not been made a Gentile or a woman. But here's Jesus, and he thinks differently. He's come for the people who didn't count. So Jesus even noticed the widow's might later on as you go on the Gospels. It's in chapter, I've got the reference here, it's chapter 21, verse 1. As they were casting their gifts into the treasury, a poor widow put in two copper coins. It was all she had. Jesus noticed that. 
There were others giving abundantly. They had plenty to, to give and create an impression. But for her, it was everything. And then the lost. So the last, the least, and the lost. And this is uh, the saving of Jesus coming to save and rescue people like our lifesaver. Some of the best love stories, as I've already said, with the Good Samaritan are unique to Luke. The one that might bump the Good Samaritan down a notch would be in uh, Luke chapter 15, the, uh, the story of the three lost, the lost coin, the lost, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Or as I would think it should really be, the lost sons, because I think both sons in that story are lost. One's just lost closer to home. So, so here we have the stories of Jesus going out to the lost. And uh, at the close of his public ministry, again, he tells us why he came. And we hear this as Jesus goes to the city of Jerusalem. He's going there for the last time. And his public ministry is about to end and it's going to become just Jesus and his disciples now. Jesus on trial. Jesus and the passion. And why is he going to do this? Well, he tells us the beautiful story and perhaps this might be another. It's another that's, I think, uniquely Luke and the story of Zacchaeus. Don't we love the story of Zacchaeus? The little man who got up the tree so he could see Jesus. And Jesus must have heard about this chief tax collector who was so excoriated in public opinion that when he stopped, he realized this person up the tree had to be that hated person. Zacchaeus, I must stay at your house today. An opportunity to, to welcome Jesus into his home. Well, that changed that man's life. And Jesus said at the end of that little incident before, as his public ministry came to an end, this, too, is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The last, the least, and the lost. Jesus is the Savior of them all. This is why he came. And so when we think about the idea of an inclusious kingdom, we shouldn't be thinking in terms of the kingdoms of this world or even the politics of this world. There's a lot of talk about inclusion today. And I think we're all inclined, when we feel on the outside, to create our own group of insiders. We're one of this group. As we do this, we pay a terrible price. The price for our pettiness is that we keep redrawing the lines which mark out the true believers, and the group gets smaller and smaller. With God, there are no outsiders. Unless we choose to exclude ourselves. Uh, how is it in our church? Is it like this? Do people feel welcome when they come? Is the doors open wide? Are our hearts open wide to people? The last, the lost and the least? Well, they should be. Jesus brings forgiveness of sins to all who receive him. That's how Luke's gospel ends. That this message of forgiveness and inclusion should be preached to all nations. It doesn't matter the color of your skin, the color of your eyes, where you were born. None of that matters. How old you are, how smart you are, what your IQ is, whether you're socially adept or you're not socially adept. Jesus brings forgiveness to all of us and all of us need him. This is his great gift to us. So this Christmas, when you think about Jesus coming, remember this. The message to the shepherds was, your Savior is born. Your Savior is born. We know, of course, why now he was born. He was born to bring salvation. And that's for you and me. Amen. May God bless his word to us this morning. And to his name be the praise and the glory. Now I'm going to uh, lead in prayer. Ordinarily here I would invite you to contribute matters for prayer. But I'm going to change that to th this week and say that if, you, if there is something in particular you'd like us to pray about, Keith has already announced that there's a prayer meeting on Wednesday. And everybody here, I can say, is thought about every Wednesday. 
and many who aren't here as well. Every seat that's occupied in this building is, uh, has its occupant prayed for on a Wednesday. So you're in our prayers and, and many times more than that. So I, I invite you if, you, if there's something on your heart that you'd like to leave for us to pray for, please do that. And we will take time uh, to remember you in our prayers. Having said that, I'm, I've scripted a prayer that I think should, should be part of our prayers for this week. And I invite you to uh, join with me as I, as I lead us in prayer. So let us pray. Lord God, almighty maker and creator of us all, we bow before you to confess that we have worshipped and served ourselves when we should have worshipped you by serving our neighbour. We have created barriers to fellowship with you by our idolatry and sin. We've built walls of division where you desired fellowship and harmony. Forgive us and save us, we earnestly pray. In the person of your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus, you came to reveal to us the kind of sacrificial living that is necessary in our broken world and to open a way of forgiveness, breaking down dividing walls and creating one body in Christ. We know what it cost him and it awes us that he came, that he was born to be our saviour. Lord Jesus Christ, as a celebration of your birth is marked in our communities, we ask that you will keep us open-hearted. You invited the shepherds, embraced the Samaritans, encouraged women as your disciples, sought the lost, welcomed sinners. Be our saviour. Save us from our idolatries and self-righteousness. We continue to be grateful that the coronavirus has been so well contained in Victoria, and that today it is possible for us to gather once again. Accept the worship we offer here, and wherever hearts are bowed before you now. Keep us safe in your care, all who have special vulnerabilities at this anxious time, thinking of beloved folk who would ordinarily be gathered with us today. We are disappointed that Australian scientists working on the COVID vaccine have had to stop the project we ask that despite the discouragement, they will be able to take positive lessons from their work and experience and continue to contribute positively to the health of the nation. As COVID vaccines come online for the most needy people, we pray that they will be made available across the world's nations. Thank you that so many of the wealthier countries are concerned to see their, their global neighbours also receive vaccination. Help us, whatever our station in life, to contribute in encouraging and helpful ways so that all people might see that your intention, like the Father Jesus spoke about, is to welcome all your children home, forgiving our sins and receiving us for his name's sake. We ask that our leaders will find ways to develop new markets for the produce of the nations and that wise and sustainable industries will emerge as the closure of previous markets stimulates new patterns of trade, especially in Europe and Asia. By your Holy Spirit, bring healing, purpose and wholeness into the lives of every troubled family. We pray for the last, the lost, and those regarded as least important. Help us to see your image in the elderly, the chronically ill, the frightened, the disabled, and the hurting. Make us agents of your saving grace. These things we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, who taught us to pray together and to say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We're going to close by singing. And the, the carol that we're going to sing is uh, number 164 and Rejoice, but you don't have that in front of you. But while shepherds watch their flocks by night, this is a para an old paraphrase of uh, that passage that uh, Amanda read earlier on. Good question. Um, I'll just have to look here. One, two, three, four. Is that too many? Five too many? I think we should try it. Five. Don't we need the last one? Well, the last one is... Well, I haven't got... The... They're very short. Okay, they're very short. Well, we're going to say... <laughs> um, okay, so this is the first verse, we're right. Will, if you want to sing... I've only got these five verses, I think. So, one, two, three... Oh, yes. I've got six, have I? Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm actually viewing what's on the screen on a mirror down here, which shows me everything in reverse and only shows me part of what's on the screen. So, so, so for viewers online, that's the technical, another technical hitch. So let's try. I'm, I'm inviting you to stand and we'll sing together. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us each and be with us all, 
now and always. Amen. Oh.